Assalamu alaikum students, welcome back to class. This is your ENG 503 and prose 2. We've had a number of uh, works being discussed in this module and we're coming towards the end of the module. But before we do, um, there are still some works that we need to discuss. We started off this module by um, discussing Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels and uh, we went on to discussing the introduction to the short story and different short stories. We had short stories by Edgar Allan Poe, we had a few by Mark Twain and um, currently we're doing short stories by Anton Chekhov. And when we were doing the introduction to the short story, I pointed out to you the fact that um, the two uh, prevalent forms of uh, short story writing are the event plot story and the second one is the Anton Chekhov um, uh, story or the Chekhovian story. Uh, which is not to say that there are uh, no other uh, formats being practiced or there are no other forms of short story. These are the two most prevalent. Chekhov's um, contribution to short story writing as his contribution to uh, drama um, cannot be debated. Um, he has written primarily about uh, Russia um, and um, he has taken characters from different walks of life but my attempt here is to show how um, the characters that he draws or the events that he talks about are not just restricted to uh, one country or one nation or one group of people they are universal and you know that one of the primary characteristics of uh, a good writer or, um, or an excellent writer um, is that his um, style must be easy to comprehend and appreciate and his themes must be universal in nature. The, um, the, the last story that we discussed by Chekhov was um, the Trousseau and I pointed out to you uh, how the situation um, of the young girl there, Manechka, is similar to that of many girls in, uh, let's say, the Pakistani society or the Indian society for that matter. Um, uh, what you what you're going to be discussing in this um, lecture is uh, the story the schoolmaster and i know that when uh, i say the word the schoolmaster or when you see it uh, on the screen in front of you you have a few ideas you have um, certain preconceived notions on what the schoolmaster is what he should be like um, and uh, what experience you, you have had. Each one of us has a different concept of the schoolmaster uh, or for that matter the schoolmistress uh, because I see a lot of uh, girls also who are uh, participating in this online program so um, the concept that we have of the schoolmaster um, differs from person to person. Um, the uh, experiences that we have of our school days are different from that of each other. One person may be a favorite of let's say one student or one group of students and another group may not like them or another person may not like it but there are some school masters or school mistresses or school teachers who are universal favorites whom the class loves also um, the age at which you uh, experience um, a school master or a school teacher is very significant um, children are very 
uh, open to suggestion. Uh, they form likes and dislikes very quickly. And you'll see that very frequently they form an attachment to one particular school teacher. And whatever that school teacher says, they will believe. But what, um, let's say, a parent or an elder in the house says, they may not believe. So I have seen many parents go to school teachers and say, you know, our child is not doing this. Could you tell him to do this? It, it can include brushing your teeth. It can include helping in the housework. It can also uh, include doing assignments or time or uh, not watching uh, TV all the time. You know, we are a generation where um, children spend a lot of time in front of the TV or the computer or uh, or or even um, these games that um, that they're playing inside the house so very frequently you will have uh, parents and elders coming to the school and complaining about a child uh, with the request that the teacher tell the child not to do a certain thing or to do something um, very, um, very, very easy to do, but which the child refuses to. So we all have our individual experiences. Um, when we look back on our school years, um, there are certain people who stand out in our memory, certain teachers for whom we have a particular uh, fondness, and certain other people um, whom we may not have liked. So um, this short story is titled The Schoolmaster and um, we, we're going to see what um, Chekhov says about the schoolmaster. Okay, so let's go on with the text. Now some of the names that Chekhov uses may be a little difficult for us to understand. Uh, but we also have to remember that our names read by a person who doesn't know, let's say, Arabic or Persian or Urdu um, would be very difficult for them to understand. So I'm going to try my best with the names. And um, if there is any place where I cannot pronounce it properly, I hope that you will be able to make that attempt and pronounce the words as they should be. So let's start with the first one. Fyodor Lukitsyosev. Lukitsyosev. Okay, so Syosev being the last name, that is um, what he is known by. The master of the factory school, maintained at the expense of the firm of Kulikin, was getting ready for the annual dinner. Okay, so Siosef is the schoolmaster um, of this, the, the factory school. There is a company that has its own um, school. Um, you will have seen it um, perhaps in, in Pakistan also. I know that the Karachi steel mills, for example, it's a big concern. It has uh, a cadet college. And uh, wherever you have the big factories, uh, in order to um, facilitate the workers, the factory owners will open up a school on the premises so that the factory workers do not have to worry about sending their school outside, um, sending their uh, children to a school, spending a lot of time picking them up, dropping them, etc., etc. So, um, Seosef is getting ready for the annual dinner. Um, and what that dinner is about, you'll find out as we proceed with the text. Every year, and the very next sentence explains it to you, every year after the school examination, the board of managers gave a dinner at which the inspector of elementary schools all who had conducted the examinations and all the managers and foremen of the factory were present. So this is like a big dinner, a big occasion that you have to celebrate the end of the school year. Now the school year may end in December, the school year may end in June, the school year may end in March. We have three systems running um, in Pakistan and uh, 
um, there are schools which um, which have their final exams uh, in March then there are other schools which have their final exams in June there are still others who have them in December so um, he does not specify um, the time of the year but what he does say is that the school year had come to an end the annual exams were over so this was um, the annual dinner that is given in um, at the end of the year and it is attended by all those who have conducted the exam um, the, the, the foremen and um, the managers etc it's, it's a kind of a big get together that they have in spite of their official character these dinners were always very good and lively sometimes these formal dinners can be terrible because uh, most of the people don't know each other uh, and therefore there is not much conversation or some big shot is uh, the chief guest and so you are very very conscious of the formality of the occasion but here Chekhov says that um, these dinners were always good and lively and the guests sat a long time over them normally at formal dinners you just want to get it over and done with and uh, go back home you have to attend them because it is an official dinner uh, but you want to get it over and done with this dinner is one which people look forward to all year and sometimes they sit for a long time afterwards discussing various things um, that have happened in the year and other things that are being planned for um, the coming year so the guests sat a long time over them forgetting distinctions of rank and recalling only their meritorious labors they ate until they were full drank amicably chattered till they were all hoarse and parted late in the evening deafening the whole factory settlement with their singing and the sound of their kisses so um, because it's an occasion on which everyone is feeling sort of relieved a school year has come to an end um, things have gone well they have uh, good food and so they sit eating and drinking until late and uh, when they go back home um, the entire community realizes that the annual dinner has coming to an end because there are loud goodbyes and uh, and see you later and happy holidays etc etc so um, this is an occasion to which all the people concerned um, look forward to and nobody is in a hurry uh, to go back home of such dinners Seosev had taken part in 13 as he had been that number of years master of the factory school so he had been there for 13 years and for 13 years he had been attending these dinners now getting ready for the 14th he was trying to make himself look as festive and correct as possible so you want to dress up for this occasion it's a formal dinner it's an official dinner everyone is going to be in his best clothes on his best behavior so Siosev also takes care of uh, his appearance and makes sure that um, he looks good when he goes there he had spent a whole hour brushing his new black suit so because this is something that happens once in a year um, he had a new suit for the occasion and he spent one hour just brushing that new suit and making sure that um, nothing was stuck uh, to his uh, suit and then he spent almost uh, an hour in front of a looking glass that is a mirror uh, while he put on a fashionable shirt so he took a long time preparing for this dinner some of you I know spend hours there there was a time when it was said that women spend a lot of time dressing up now I know some of the men and particularly you young men uh, spend a lot of time uh, dressing up for formal occasions sometimes you spend time just trying to look casual uh, but it's a good thing you need to take care of your appearance you need to make sure that those who meet you are impressed by your appearance as well as 
your behavior and uh, speech. So um, Chekhov says that um, Siosef spends uh, an hour brushing his suit and then he spends another hour in front of the looking glass, in front of the mirror, because he's putting on a fashionable shirt. You know, um, the different kinds of fashions that men have, um, particularly in shirts, sometimes the collars are long, sometimes they are short, sometimes they are thin collars, sometimes they are wide collars. Uh, and you have many different variations, um, but when you are wearing a suit, then one thing is certain that you have to wear a shirt with it. Um, you, you may or may not want to wear a tie with it. If you want to be very formal, then you will wear a tie. Otherwise, you'll say, well, I'll put on the coat and the pants but I will not put on the tie. The choice is yours. It also depends on um, the formality of the occasion. Some occasions you have a note written at the bottom of the invitation which says uh, dress casual or dress business. So business for men would be very specific. So here because it's an official dinner, it's an annual dinner, so Siosef spends a long time um, getting ready. And one of the reasons is, you know how some things go wrong when you are trying to get uh, extra, uh, extra good looking? Uh, you might not find something, uh, you might not be able to, um, to, 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 to find anything. So he says that uh, the stud would not go into the buttonhole. So this is one of those shirts that has two buttonholes and you use cuffs or you, you, you use studs. So um, he says, and he, he got so frustrated and he got so angry that he started shouting and screaming. Um, and because uh, his wife was the only one who was within uh, hearing distance, so all these were addressed to his wife. Also, because she is probably the one who is responsible for getting his clothes ready. Since she is not going to the dinner, it's only uh, an official dinner, uh, no spouses or family invited. So uh, he shouts at her and he says, oh, why could you not have fixed this before I came? Uh, and see, I cannot uh, wear this shirt, etc., etc. Anyway, so uh, he spends a lot of time and then he shouts and he screams. And his poor wife is trying to do everything um, that she can just so that he will get ready on time and will not be late for dinner. So she bustles around him and she says, oh, let me fix this and uh, I could have done this um, and um, you, you're not putting the shirt on right. And uh, she, gets, she gets frustrated, he gets frustrated and then they're both exhausted with the effort. They're running around the place. Uh, he's been um, he's been getting ready for a long time and he's still not ready. So obviously uh, he's very frustrated and he's shouting and screaming uh, at his uh, poor wife. When his polished boots were brought uh, him from the kitchen, he had not strength to pull them on. You know those long boots that you have? Sometimes it takes a lot of effort to get into them and then you have boots of different kinds. Some boots you have laces. You know how terrible it is when you're doing up laces? Um, he is so frustrated. He's been running around uh, so much, shouting and screaming, that when his wife brings him his boots, he doesn't even have the strength to put them on. She's tired. He's tired. So um, he just lies down, she brings him water, he drinks that water, but he's feeling very weak with all that uh, effort that he has put in. So he lies down, um, she brings him a glass of water, and then she says, how weak you have grown. You ought not to go to this dinner at all. She's like a very um, sort of Eastern wife, very concerned for her husband's health. And she says, 
you know, you have become so weak. Just dressing up for this dinner has made you tired. Maybe you shouldn't go to this dinner. And he says, no advice, please. Now that makes him really angry. And when I say that he is, uh, that this situation is something that can also be brought to uh, our situation, this is what I mean by it. The wife running around, the, the schoolmaster shouting at the wife, and uh, then the wife expressing her concern, she says, maybe you shouldn't go to this dinner. And he says, don't give me any advice. I know what to do and what not to do. I know what has to be done and what uh, is not important. So let me decide that and I'm going to the dinner. She can't do anything, poor thing. He was in a very bad temper for he had been much displeased with the recent examinations. So now we come to um, the real cause of this distemper or um, this bad mood. Remember the school year has just finished, exams are over uh, and it's because of um, the exam results that he is in a bad temper. Some teachers um, get very emotional about the results of their students, particularly students who are hardworking, students who otherwise do well, when they do badly then teachers get very upset. And so, um, schoolmaster Siosev uh, was not really very happy with the result of the recent examination. The examination, and Chekhov says, um, the examination itself had gone off splendidly. All the boys of the senior division had gained certificates and prizes. You know, he, he's a very good schoolmaster. Um, the students are good, um, they're hard working. So all of them have certificates, all of them have prizes because they have done so well. Uh, both the managers of the factory and the government officials were pleased with the result. But that was not enough for the schoolmaster. The schoolmaster is accustomed to having the best results in the entire region. So even if the slightest thing goes wrong, he gets upset. And that is what has happened now. Although Chekhov says that the results were good, all the, the, the students in the senior division got very good grades, they were given prizes, they were given certificates, yet the result had displeased the schoolmaster. Let's find out what it is particularly um, that has bothered the schoolmaster. He, okay, so he was vexed that Babkin, a boy who never made a mistake in writing, had made three mistakes in the, dis in the dictation. Now you know why he's angry. Now you know why he's shouting at his wife. One of his students had made three mistakes. This was a boy who never made a mistake. And, um, uh, and, and this is just one of the things that had happened. Another boy, Sergeyev, had been so excited that he could not remember 17 times 13. Now that's difficult. That is not fair. 17 times 13. Uh, these are tables, this is math, you have to memorize it. It's very difficult, you know, um, to, to remember the table of 17 uh, to 13. Um, when, when we were children, we had to learn tables up to times 12. Uh, but um, children now have to learn tables up to um, times 10. So, um, you know, that, that is uh, becoming easier and easier. But uh, the time and the place that Chekhov is talking about, they had to um, learn tables farther than that, probably right up to times 20. So he says that this boy, Sergeyev, could not remember 17 times 13. 17 multiplied by 13, what's the result? 
the inspector and this is another problem the inspector a young and inexperienced man had chosen a difficult article for dictation how good were you at dictation I was good but then we always knew what lesson we were going to get dictation from so we would memorize the spelling lists and make sure that when the teacher was dictating we listened very carefully the whole exercise of dictation is one um, that is concerned as much with the listening and speaking as it is with the writing um, the teacher speaks the students listen and then write so between listening and writing the the, the brain works uh, the brain breaks the sound down into symbols and you put those symbols or those letters on the paper now what had happened was that um, the inspector who was a very young and inexperienced man had chosen uh, a text that was beyond the level of the students now when you do that you do it with the aim of bringing the students level up but if you give them a very difficult text they will end up by not learning anything so this is what seems to have happened here and that makes Yosef very angry and then this is not this is not the end Lyapunov is the master of a neighboring school and the inspector had asked um, Lyapunov to dictate the article and Lyapunov had not behaved like a good comrade uh, because when he was dictating the article he had not enunciated the sounds very clearly you know in dictation it's very important um, that you enunciate each word clearly if you do not do it the students will not understand it and they will go and write something that you did not dictate so there are a number of things that are uh, troubling Seosev one is Babkin who made three mistakes the other is Sergeyev who could not remember 17 times 13 and then the third is that the, ins the inspector chooses a very difficult article for dictation and he gives it to Lyapunov um, the master of a neighboring school and Lyapunov um, deliberately according to Chekhov dictates in such a voice that it is not clear with the result that Babkin makes mistakes and that is something that um, is very difficult for uh, Anton Chekhov to understand so this was an aside we go back to um, Seosev in his house trying to pull on his boots remember the leather boots were brought from the kitchen they had been polished and uh, now he finally needs the assistance of his wife once he has the boots on he looks at himself in the looking glass uh, takes his walking stick and sets off for the dinner just before the factory managers house the factory managers house is um, the the big place where the annual dinner is going to be held just before he gets there um, he uh, he had a little mishap and this mishap is that he started coughing and it was not just an ordinary cough it was a very violent fit of coughing and he coughs so much that he has to sit down he can't stand anymore so uh, he sits down and um, it's, it's such a hacking cough that people who are inside the house they hear the sound of that cough and um, they come out and uh, when they come out they see that the cap that he was wearing has flown off and uh, his stick is not in his hand so um, so so strong is that uh, fit of coughing that his cap flies off his he drops his stick 
and he has to sit down on the steps of the house in order to regain his um, his breath so um, the teachers and um, the school inspector they come out and they're very surprised to see him sitting there uh, the inspector says Fyodor Lukic is that you you have come and um, Fyodor Lukic Syosev is very surprised and he says why not now this is where you start feeling that there's something wrong somewhere what is wrong you don't yet know but you will discover it in the course of the short story the inspector says you ought to be home my dear fellow you are not at all well today now everyone is concerned the teachers are concerned the inspector is concerned but what does yourself says that I am just the same today as I was yesterday and if my present is not agreeable to you I can go back so after having spent more than two hours getting ready Seosev gets to the factory manager's house, um, gets a violent fit of coughing and when people come out and say, oh but you've come, you shouldn't have come, he says, if you don't like me, I'll go back. But that is enough to tell the people that he is getting angry and the inspector and the teacher say, oh Fyodor Lukic, you must not talk like that please come in the function is really in your honor not ours you're the schoolmaster it's the school year that has come to an end we are just people from the factory so he says we are delighted to see you of course we are so then um, they take him inside and when um, Fyodor Lukic Siosev goes inside he sees everything is ready in the big dining room um, there were these German prints on the wall uh, and, and flowers on the tables and there were these two tables there was a large one uh, for the dinner proper and then there was a smaller one for the hors d'oeuvres now the hors d'oeuvres or the appetizers uh, are generally placed on a smaller table um, if you have uh, had this experience when you go out to a formal dinner there's a small table on which you will find maybe the salads and the appetizers and then there's the large table uh, where all the food uh, is served so you take the hors d'oeuvres you take the appetizers and then you go and you fill your plate in with different things uh, and you you stand around buffet style and eat and at the same time that you're eating you also um, chat with friends so um, this is how he describes uh, the dining hall and uh, because um, dinner was taking place before sundown so he says there was a little light coming from outside a little sunlight um, and uh, you you got it through the lowered blinds they had not put up the blinds because um, then it would have been um, very very strong sunlight that they were getting so they get a kind of muted um, light and uh, that that makes everything looks um, very very beautiful so anyway um, the, the place is all set for the formal dinner and it was all in keeping with the master of the house who was a good natured little German with a round little stomach and affectionate oily little eyes Adolf Andriich Bruni that was his name um, he's the factory manager and he's bustling around the room trying to help everyone asking what everyone needs um, and he's he's a very good host he's very hospitable um, and he goes around making sure that everyone has enough to drink everyone has enough to eat which is you know what um, a host normally does uh, you have to make sure that everyone who comes to your house uh, has the same amount of attention 
and nobody can complain, you know, nobody looked after me or nobody offered me anything. Some people can get upset at that. Uh, and um, so Bruni makes sure that he goes around, he talks with everyone, um, he, he offers them food, and in, uh, in, in other words, he's trying to, uh, to please everyone and to show his friendly feelings. Normally, uh, factory managers um, are not very friendly people because they have uh, authority, they have power. So um, they would not be doing this, but this is a person who is very, very different. And in any case, this whole idea of the dinner uh, is very different uh, from places where you have an hierarchical order and people have to behave in a certain manner. Um, and some are, um, some are uh, served, others are ignored, etc., etc. But here you see Bruni uh, running around the whole place trying to serve everyone, trying to make sure that everyone has uh, equal attention. And Chekhov says that he was almost like a friendly little dog, you know, going everywhere, yap, 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 yap. I do you have enough to eat? Can I get you something to eat? Um, are you sure you have everything? So like a friendly little dog trying to make sure that everyone is happy. And he is excited to see CO7. He says, whom do I behold? Fyodor Lukic. How delightful. You have come in spite of your illness. Gentlemen, let me congratulate you. Fyodor Lukic has come. Now this is a dinner that's taking place at the end of the school year. So it's important for the schoolmaster to be there. But um, because he's not been well, uh, everyone assumes that he will not be able to come to dinner. And so when he does come, when he does turn up, everyone is, um, is, is happy to see him and they make comments about him. The school teachers were already crowding around the table and eating the hors d'oeuvres. So probably it's one of the very few occasions that the school teachers have of getting um, a formal dinner. You know, school teachers throughout the world uh, have very poor pay packages. So uh, an occasion like this, when they have a free meal, well, it's a godsend to them. So the school teachers, uh, Chekhov says, were already eating the hors d'oeuvres. So Yosef frowns because he thinks that they should have waited for him. You know, after all, he is the schoolmaster. Uh, and uh, as, as such, he thinks that they are all juniors and they should have... Uh, waited for him before they started eating. Uh, he also notices Lyapunov among these people uh, and he has a bone to pick with him. He's very, very angry uh, with Lyapunov and he says it was not acting like a comrade. No, indeed. Gentlemanly people don't dictate like that. So, um, when he sees Lyapunov, he straight away launches into his attack and he says, you know, you were dictating in this way and this is not fair and that's not how gentlemen behave. Um, so the moment he sees Lyapunov, he starts off uh, and Lyapunov gets very angry. He says, good Lord, you're still harping on it. You know, the exams are over and done with, results have been declared. And Lyapunov says, why, why are you still going on with it? You know, get it over with. It's finished. It's over. Done with. Aren't you sick of it? And um, uh, Seosef says, yes, still harping on it. My babkin has never made mistakes. I know why you dictated like that. You simply wanted my pupils to be floored so that your school might seem better than mine. I know all about it. So Seosef thinks that it's all a conspiracy and he has this conspiracy theory about Lyapunov not um, dictating properly because he wanted his own school uh, to get good grades and he wanted uh, Seosef's students 
um, to, to, to not understand what he was uh, dictating and, uh, and get bad results. So Yosef gets very angry and he says, yes, I'm still harping on it. It is still on my mind. You may have forgotten about it, but I ca cannot forget about it because my student never makes mistakes. And so it's your fault. It's not Babkin's fault. So he gets very angry, very emotional about it. And Lapinov says, why are you trying to get up a quarrel? Why the devil do you pester me? The exams are over, they finish. finished, the students have good grades. Why must you bring this thing up at a formal dinner? This is a dinner where we are celebrating the end of the school year. You shouldn't be bringing up things like results of, and the result of one particular uh, student. And the, now this is, you know, uh, the place where both of them are angry. And uh, the inspector comes in and he says, Oh, come gentlemen, is it worthwhile to get so heated over a trifle? Three mistakes, not one mistake, does it matter? So the inspector tries to bring the lighter mood in and he says, You know, this is not very important. Why are you arguing about it? The exams are over, the students have distinctions, they've been given prizes. Um, forget about it. This is this is a very um, a, a very um, good occasion. We're celebrating. Um, the students have done well. The factory has done well, and that is why we have this dinner. So please uh, stop fighting. But Siosev cannot forget, and he says, "My Babkin has never made mistakes." So Lyapunov you know, gets really angry and he says, he won't leave off. He takes advantage of his position as an invalid and worries us all to death. Well, sir, I am not going to consider your being ill. Now there you have the crux of the whole thing. When Lyapunov makes a reference to his illness, it's like Seosev just blows up. And he says, let my illness alone. What is it to do with you? They all keep repeating it at me. Illness, 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 as though I need your sympathy. Besides, where have you picked up the notion that I am ill? I was ill before the examinations, but now I have completely recovered. There is nothing left of it but weakness. So don't talk to me of illness. Now you can see both of them are getting angry. Um, Lyapunov thinks that Seosev is using his illness uh, and Seosev is angry because everybody keeps on talking about il his illness uh, and he doesn't want that. It, it upsets me to have people talking about him being ill all the time. So he says that I am completely recovered and um, it is only um, the it's, it's only my weakness that reminds me that I have uh, been ill. And uh, the scripture teacher, um, Father Nicholas says, you have regained your health. Well, thank God. You ought to rejoice, but you are irritable and so on. So the, the, the priest, the, the one who, um, who teaches scripture, who teaches the Bible, he says, you have regained your health and you should be thankful to God for that. You shouldn't go on arguing and um, picking up fights. <clears throat> and Siosef says, you are a nice one too. Questions ought to be straightforward, clear. But you kept asking riddles. That's not the thing to do. So when the priest or when Father Nicolay tries to intercede, Sosef turns around on him and he says, you're the same. You should not have done this. By combined efforts, they succeeded in soothing him and making him sit down to the table. He was a long time making up his mind what to drink and pulling a wry face, drank a wine glass of some green liquor. Then he drew a bit of pie towards him and sulkily picked out of the inside an egg with onion on it. At the first mouthful, it seemed to him that there was no salt in it. 
he sprinkled salt on it and at once pushed it away as the pie was too salt. So just let's go back a bit. Um, they finally get round to eating. They make him sit down at the table and then when he's sitting at the table he can't decide what he's going to eat or drink. Finally he has a little uh, green liquor and then he um, takes a look at the food. There's this uh, pie that is being served to him and he takes a portion out of it uh, and then he says uh, there's no salt in it. So they bring him salt and once he has um, shaken the salt over the food he starts to taste it and he says oh it's too salty I don't want this so he's in a bad mood he's in a bad mood because some of his students uh, he thinks have been penalized he's in a bad mood because people keep on referring to his uh, his his health and he doesn't like that he says you forget about my health I'm perfectly healthy I'm just a little weak. At dinner, Siosev was seated between the inspector and Bruni. After the first course, the toasts began. You know how they drink to the health of a person. It says, long live so and so. So after the first course, after the soup had been um, consumed, they started drinking the toast. You know how they do? They take up a, a, a glass of wine and they say, okay, to so-and-so's health, to so-and-so's happiness. So the inspector starts off and he says, I consider it my agreeable duty to propose a vote of thanks to the absent school wardens, Daniel Petrovich and, 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 and Bruni says, and Ivan Petrovich. So these are the two uh, wardens um, of um, the the factory and so the first toast is proposed um, in their favor and Ivan Petrovich Kulikin who grudges no expense for the school and I propose to drink their health so um, one after the other they start proposing toasts and Bruni jumps up and he says, I propose to the health of the honored inspector of elementary schools, Pavel Kanatevich Nadarov. Now this person is not around and yet you um, drink a toast to him. The third toast was always that of Siosev's. So on this occasion he gets up and he begins to speak but instead of a toast instead of just one or two sentences he starts off and he makes a long speech and in that speech what he says is he says I have been here 14 years and there have been many intrigues and there are people who are trying to undermine my influence uh, there are people who have been writing secret reports on me um, but the good thing is that the authorities know him, they like his work, so they have never paid any heed to people who have um, tried to create trouble. Now what he's actually referring to is um, his colleagues Lyapunov and uh, what was the name of the, ins uh, of the, the person who dictated um, the article? How many of you remember? Okay, so he he's actually making oblique references um, to these people who he thinks are doing deliberately um, to sort of uh, wipe out the good work um, that he has done. But he says, I'm not going to take any names. I know that I have enemies here, but the authorities also know the kind of work that I do and therefore they reward me, they know what to do and what not to do. So, and then he starts to narrate how he is better than other schoolmasters. He says everywhere else schoolmasters get 200 or 300 rubles while I get 500. So he's trying to say that he gets 500 rubles because his work is better than anyone else's in that um, particular school year. 
so he says you know my house is being done again and uh, I get more salary uh, and um, the the owners are very liberal um, they provide the students with everything and uh, and and to do all this the school is indebted not to the heads of the firm who live abroad and, and and hardly know anything about it but to a man who in spite of his German origin and Lutheran faith was a Russian at heart so he makes this long speech uh, people get bored uh, people start um, closing their eyes closing their ears to it um, because he's he's throughout his speech is referring to his enemies he never once tells a, a name but um, he does mention that he has enemies so when he finishes his speech um, he uh, everybody is glad that it is over and done with um, and they see that he's exhausted he's perspiring and um, when, he, when he comes to the end of his speech, he proposes a toast to Bruni because he thinks that um, Bruni is a Russian at heart, although he is a German in origin. And when he finishes, everyone sighs with relief because people had started to get bored. Um, Bruni of course shakes Joseph's hand and he's very very happy that Joseph has made this speech and he says oh I thank you I'm very happy that you understand me I with my whole heart wish you all things good but I ought only to observe you exaggerate my importance so then Bruni also starts off on a counter speech uh, and he says oh you are so kind and you're so sweet and I do not deserve all this praise um, anyway um, so he, um, he he starts off on uh, another uh, speech and he says if we pay you 500 rubles a year it is because you are valuable uh, and um, and we're going to make sure that um, we take care of your wife and your children they are very very special for us and uh, we know that the school children love you and uh, you have shown us wonderful results you are a schoolmaster to the marrow of your bones you must have been born a teacher you have all the gifts innate vocation long experience and love for your work so it's it's because of these qualities um, of nature that you were uh, recruited uh, for the the factory school and we do not regret it because you have shown amazing records and while he's making that speech he makes a couple of references to um, Seosev's health and these references kind of upset Seosev because everybody keeps on talking about his health and he says that he's fine so he says that um, this um, the inspector makes this long speech uh, and um, as soon as the dinner begins now this is the pre-dinner speech as soon as the dinner begins everybody talks of Seosef because Bruni has made a speech about him and it's important to note that um, this um, this whole dinner is taking place in the factory managers house in Bruni's house so obviously they have to uh, compliment him now when he makes that speech you find that the entire company changes Lyapunov and all the others they also start singing praises of the schoolmaster and that makes you realize how universal the theme of the story is because the moment someone in authority starts clapping or starts praising someone all the people who are listening or who are watching him will also start clapping and say oh so and so has done such wonderful work without knowing anything about it so um, when um, 
When Bruni makes this speech, everyone forgets about Siosev's nasty temper and the, the comments that he has made, and they all praise him and say that, you know, um, you, you're a wonderful man, uh, and everybody starts talking with him. Uh, and sh trying to show Siosev that he is a man of importance. So everyone um, starts praising him and um, Siosev, you know, because he's so used to being admired, he's been at um, this place for 14 years, it's, uh, it's nothing special for him to to be admired and to be said that oh you're a wonderful teacher so um, he, um, he he takes everything for granted and um, when Bruni makes this speech everyone starts congratulating him and everyone starts saying oh you're such a wonderful uh, teacher even the, um, the the young teachers those who come from uh, poor backgrounds, they start praising him and um, throughout all this um, Siosev doesn't feel that there's anything wrong but what happens is that Bruni gets carried away and um, he sort of gets up and he says that um, you know we uh, the, the factory owners are very grateful for the contribution of uh, Fyodor Lukic Siosev and we want uh, him to know that he will, his, uh, his work, his contributions to the factory and the school will never be forgotten. Now when he says that, Siosev detects something and he says, you know, what is he trying to tell me? Um, and, and when Bruni goes on to say that the factory will always take care of his wife and children, um, Siosef starts thinking, why is he talking about my wife and children? Why is he not saying anything about me? So, all these questions they arise in his mind and he doesn't have an answer to them. So he starts thinking uh, of what could possibly have happened um, which leads Bruni to talk about his, his wife and family but not about himself. He just detects some a change in the entire company and the entire company becomes very sympathetic and he um, all of a sudden he feels weak and he feels the desire to weep so he sits down and people keep on saying oh give him air, give him a little water to drink and uh, when he grows calm he uh, sets off for home and he's a little mystified. He is surprised at what he felt. He's surprised that he felt so weak. He had not exerted himself. Um, he's surprised at how people were talking about him. So when he goes back home, the first thing he does is he looks at himself in the looking glass, in the mirror, to see whether he has changed in any way. And um, he, he, he thinks that he should not have cried the, the way he did. Uh, but what he doesn't have uh, an idea about is that that illness that he is supposed to have recovered from was a deadly one. Remember that, that fit of coughing that he had, this weakness that he has? Uh, the desire to start weeping. He says, I shouldn't have blubbered there. My color, my, my face is looking much better than it was yesterday. I'm not as weak today and my cough is only a stomach cough. You know, uh, coughs can be of many different kinds. So he starts to um, change his clothes 
and uh, then he goes to the table where there is a pile of his students exercise books and picking up Babkin's notebook he sits down and he starts to think about the beautiful handwriting of um, of Babkin and all this time the district doctor was sitting in the next room and telling his wife in a whisper that Seosev should not have gone to the dinner because he does not have more than a week to live. Now this is the climax and this is where Chekhov leaves us and does not give us an explanation. It's up to you, it's up to me as a reader to think of how Chekhov builds the story from the, from the time that he starts uh, the preparation for the dinner, through the dinner and how he comes back and he sits looking at his students handwriting, it's beautiful handwriting and all the while what is happening within him is silent, he has no idea of the extent of his illness. The others know that he is very ill. His wife when he comes back is being told by the district doctor that Seosev, Fyodor Lukic Seosev does not have more than a week to live. You know when we were doing the introduction to the short stories one of the um, one of the features of the short story that I pointed out was that it is a narrative that is complete and that can be read in one sitting. This has been a narrative that you can read in one sitting and that sitting for today is over. Take care of yourselves and until the next lecture, Allah Hafiz.